What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the My Other Passion podcast. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports. We have a really exciting guest for you today, Peter Moore, a prolific executive, someone who worked at Sega and gave us the Dreamcast, someone who worked at Microsoft, gave us the Xbox 360. He was the CEO of Liverpool. He was the president and COO of Electronic Arts. He's been so close to so much of the IP and the cultural institutions that are so important to us, to me, to I think most people who read and watch everything that we do at FOS. So I'm really excited to talk to this guy. He has so many insights. Like, this is who you want to sit down. I know they talk about 50,000 or dinner with Jay-Z. They need to be talking about 50,000 or dinner with Peter Moore because this dude has seen it all. He has so much to say about it all. And why don't we just get right into it? But first, let's take a quick break to hear from our partners at NetSuite. We'll be right back. This is it, the putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. You can't see anything. And for some of you, it's probably how you're running your business. Poor visibility. You can't see anything because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software. And to see the full picture, you really need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system. It's going to give you a full picture of your business. I'm talking financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more. NetSuite is really everything you need in one place. Let you automate your manual processes. It's going to help you close your books faster than you ever have. And ultimately, it's going to help you stay ahead of the competition. 93% of surveyed businesses increase their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. And already 31,000 businesses use NetSuite. So this summer, there's only so much time left in it. But for right now, NetSuite has a special financing program for those ready to upgrade. Go to netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. One more time, netsuite.com slash my other passion. This is a special one of a kind financing offer. This is the number one financial system for growing businesses. So do yourself a favor, netsuite.com slash my other passion. Take your business to the next level. Peter Moore, thanks for jumping on the podcast. Uh, really exciting to have you here today. My pleasure, and thank you. It's a nice looking background there. Where are you? Uh, where are you at today? Uh, this is my home. I live in Montecito, which is in uh, the Santa Barbara Hills in California on the on the central coast here. And yeah, it's uh, reflective of being uh, at Liverpool uh, during three very fortunate seasons uh, during my tenure as CEO. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm not too far from you. I'm down in L.A. and definitely want to get up to Santa Barbara at some point. I feel like... You know, maybe I could stop by a game. I know you just uh, you just um, part of the ownership group of this team uh, yeah. just announced. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the jumping off point for our conversation. You have such a long, prolific career, so many different things to talk about, different industries. Um, but this most recent move with, um, you know, United Soccer, what does that mean to you? Um, what can we expect and and why now? Yeah, so we uh, last Tuesday here in Santa Barbara announced the uh, formation of the Santa Barbara Sky FC. Um, it'll be a USL League One team, uh, men's team and a women's team that will also play um, uh, yet to be determined uh, within USL, whether it's going to be W League or Super League. But we will commence play in 2024. A lot of work to do uh, between uh, now and then, and not the least of which is getting players and coaches and staff. But uh, we are, are very much um, uh, excited to be part of this amazing soccer community here on the Central Coast uh, and being able to bring a professional team here for the first time in many, many decades um, to Santa Barbara and, and delighted to be part of USL uh, as you know, North America ramps up for the excitement of World Cup 2026 in the 40 plus years that I've been living here, I've never seen soccer so um, evolved and mature and part of the fabric of major sports. Uh, and it's it's been a long slog since I first arrived in the 70s to play and coach. But here we are with, with leagues like MLS, obviously, the U.S. national team uh, qualifying for the World Cup finals in Qatar in November, December. And then the excitement will turn after that competition is over towards 2026, when you will see uh, the World Cup in in Canada, United States and Mexico. So we felt it was an opportune time and 
I certainly uh, felt that um, I could apply my experiences at Liverpool and mm-hmm. and a little bit of cash to get everything going here as well as the founding investor and uh, USL have been uh, tremendously supportive, um, you know, in getting uh, helping us get everything going here. And uh, we're off to a great start. The community response, the um, commercial business uh, response uh, has been immense. So we're excited. How was the little gala event? Uh, if it wasn't a couple hours for me, I, I would have maybe tried to drive up to Santa Barbara. It seemed like a good time. But how was that? No, it's great. We, we rented the rooftop of the Moxie. The Moxie is a technology museum here that sits right in the center of town on State Street, which Anybody that's been to Santa Barbara knows State Street is the main drag that goes from uh, the wharf all the way into downtown. Um, We had about 120 guests. uh, And as I say, USL executives were very supportive and flew out to be with us there. The mayor gave uh, a a resounding speech, a former rugby player that understands the value of team sports, uh, Mayor Rouse. And so um, we were able to not only announce the team, but to show our brand, our colors, our merchandise, and actually started taking deposits on season tickets. So it all came together very, very well. But like I say, there's a lot of work to do between then and, and, and 2024 when we'll kick off uh, playing in USL League One. I've definitely seen this shift that's happened with football, with soccer in the States. Um, you know, I grew up and I'm sort of like a late 90s, 2000s kid, very much different culture 20 years ago. Um, In that time since, I've seen my friends, they're all waking up first thing on Saturdays to go watch Premier League. You know, they're at the the American pubs in New York City and wherever, uh, you know, at six, seven in the morning. Um, Also, my kids are in soccer. I see how active those communities are. When I was up in San Francisco and I was like, I was there for the Cell GP uh, championship, which is a lot of fun. Um, but we're by the marina, and like those fields were just like incredibly packed out. You know, it seemed like every kid in San Francisco was there. Uh, so you're seeing the cultural shift. We have 2026 coming up. People always reference that. And you have Apple doing this, you know, billions of dollars deal with MLS. Like, incredibly exciting. I think it's. It's something that you can't deny anymore, right? All these Americans who have ownership stakes in the European teams, et cetera. But I do love, and I would love to hear from someone like you who can like really speak to it. I We pose this question at Front Office Sports in our newsletters and our stories sometimes of just, you know, we're constantly reporting on it, but we'll have people who reply and say, mm, it's exciting, but I'm like not really sold. Like they said this in 1994 at that World Cup. They said this at the turn of the century. Like, but you've been in it. You've been here for decades. Um, what can you say that's just so definitively different? Of course, all the investments and stuff that I mentioned, but just from like an attitude perspective and an adoption perspective, how do you see Americans viewing the game now versus 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago? Well, I can go back 40 years when I first arrived here in coaching uh, in the Midwest, in the Cleveland area in, in the mid-70s. And um, there, there was strong participation, but it was always for, for uh, primarily suburban families who loved the fact, and you touched on it, that soccer was a more active sport than, than maybe baseball and, you know, a little bit safer maybe than American football. And, and look, and I, and I love all American sports, but soccer always was going to be something that was requiring multi-generational participation and understanding. And so, you know, I was very involved um, in in getting MLS up and running as my uh, job at Reebok director of soccer at first and then head of global sports marketing. And uh, teams like the New England Revolution and the Colorado Colorado Rapids leaned on us heavily in those early years to to get going. Everything from design of logos and, and uniforms and and even go get players, uh, you know, alongside their their coaching staff. So, and and it had a rough. You're right. It had a rough beginning. And where, if you look back at that period, it, it's only for the foresight of of owners like Lamar Hunt and Phil Anschutz and and, and Robert Kraft that came in and, and, and bailed out the league um, and kept it going into the late 90s. Um, I think you fast forward then into the uh, globalization of satellite television and the ability all of a sudden, which I never had when I first came here to the States, to to watch games, to watch quality games, to watch the Premier League, to watch Bundesliga, La Liga. And then you go um, to look at, to your point, if we go then and start seeing American players 
Um, unfortunately, having to go to Europe, and particularly the Bundesliga during that period, and a little less the, the Premier League, players like Clint Dempsey, Brian McBride, uh, Landon Donovan, Tim Howard, you know, all of these players, um, you know, that had to go elsewhere to play, to hone their craft. Um, but I think really it was the NBC deal to bring the Premier League uh, here, you know, on Saturday mornings and to be able to introduce families because it was brilliant Saturday. It is brilliant Saturday morning mm -hmm. watching, um, except for those 4.30 kickoffs here on the West Coast, which could get a little uh, little rough for me. But It's really um, tough for us. Extra tough yeah, for us West Coasters. Absolutely. But, but the perspective I've always had is now you've got, you know, mothers and fathers who played the game at a decent level and who can coach the game well and can encourage their kids. You didn't have that when I first arrived in America. And we always said, you know, when, when these kids grow up and they have their kids and have the benefit of their experiences, high school players, collegiate players, um, so on and so forth. And you're seeing that now, this kind of perfect storm of, let's say, the U.S. women's national team in particular, the U.S. men's national team doing well, qualifying for the World Cup. You've got MLS firing on all cylinders now and franchises getting 30, 40, 50,000 attending. You're right there in the heart of it in L.A. with the Galaxy. So and I went to the Galaxy LAFC match, and it, it blew my mind. I was like, wow, soccer has arrived in America. I understand that um, that venue isn't you know as large as some, but it it's pretty big and it's pretty impressive. And like, there's real serious fandom happening right here in LA and like across America. In fact, I just remembered that part of why we've had some contention with people who have, I guess, differing viewpoints about the ascent of soccer in the States is because there was in particular one story, uh, FOS Ram that was basically like, it can be, number four like it's on its way to possibly supplant nhl or like it could even be bigger than mlb one day i think mlb was like where a lot for a lot of people is a bridge too far it's such an american game but i think also just the fact that there's reports and studies that project some type of rise like that and even just going with my own eyes and seeing like you know how serious people take mls uh it certainly got me invested and the future of it. Yeah, I know. Look, MLS is going to be the key to everything, as well as building the pyramid, which we're a part of here in Santa Barbara. Underneath that, every major footballing nation in this world has got a strong pyramid system. And by that, I mean from when you're under five, under six, playing for a team, you can have a straight runway to professionalism. You can see it. And, and, and in most instances, you don't have to leave your own town to go from under six, all the way to full-time pro. You know, in places like the UK, Germany, France, Spain, there are professional teams in just about every major town. And so you have that runway. And one of the things that I wanted to do here in Santa Barbara was to provide what is a very powerful soccer community, particularly at the youth level here, that pathway to playing for their hometown team. You know, when I first got here, you'd talk to kids and they go, yeah, I, I, I want to play for Santa Barbara Soccer Club, which is great. And then, and then what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to, I want to play for the LA Galaxy. I want to play for the LAFC. I want to play for San Jose Earthquakes. No, I want you to play for the Santa Barbara Sky Football Club. And I, I really feel like that, certainly when I was a kid, growing up in Liverpool, yeah, obviously I wanted to play for Liverpool. I was never going to play for Liverpool. You know, from the perspective of, of my talent, I was a good player, but never, ever going to be anywhere close to that good. But you have aspirations and, and, and you dream about it and you work hard on the practice pitch and, and, and you learn all of the skills of being part of a team rather than playing individual sports. And I think that that is critical. And in, in, in today's world, having strong um, esprit de corps, camaraderie, you know, work ethics, teams coming together and in particular having you know, uh, you know, divisive communities come together through the beautiful game. Um, you know, we're, we're in a world today where we're at loggerheads with each other on just about every issue. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's tough, uh, particularly the next generation growing up who have, who are growing up through a pandemic, who are growing up through, through war in Ukraine. And, you know, there is this ability and politics in this country has never been more divided. So when you have platforms like soccer, that people can all come together, don't need to speak the language, don't need to share the same political beliefs or whatever, um, but you can all kick a ball and you all understand the game because it's pretty simple. Um, it's yeah. it's a powerful platform. And, and 
very important here in Santa Barbara, we'll have both men's and women's um, and, and, and dedicate our resources equally to those to make sure that we can build this as best we can together here. You're seeing back Well, in, that's great because, uh, Peter, I was, I was wondering what is the appeal for USL for you? Um, you know, we hear about MLS predominantly and USL is naturally, it is smaller, but what do you view the upside as? Um, it's just not, it's not what you hear about as much. Like, you you know, there's these transactions that are going on with teams being sold. And I think I want to understand from you, um, I think it can be perceived as almost like, you know, like a novelty, like this smaller team is a team in Santa Barbara. And um, I guess, can you paint the picture for people, especially from, you know, a business standpoint of just like what the potential is that you see of this from our earning potential to like the type of, you know, economic response that you can create in Santa Barbara. Uh, Cause I'm sure you're thinking, you know, years ahead. So like, what do you see happening in that regard? Well, I, you know, I'll refer back to my comments about a pyramid. The USL fits squarely in the center of that pyramid as, as leagues, no different than leagues anywhere else in the world. I'll, I'll take England, for example, everybody, knows the Premier League, but underneath that is what's known as the Football League, which are three Mm -hmm. different leagues, the Championship, League One, League Two, that that are stacked in order. So there's four leagues, all with promotion and relegation, uh, which Mm -hmm. we don't have, unfortunately, in this country yet. Uh, But from the perspective of of the ability for a USL to to identify talent, and, and look, MLS is doing a great job in the major metropolitan areas, as you and I have talked, Los Angeles, New York, Atlanta, um, you know, you see, and, and, and there's a, but there's a, a need for professionalism at, at smaller cities and smaller communities like Santa Barbara. So in answer to your question, I looked at USL, I've been very aware of it, um, you know, for many years since, since, you know, it's in, I think it's 12th year of existence and it's grown now to 38 full-time professional teams spread around the country. It's, it's to your point as well, there's going to be more and more coming online by the time we're, um, playing in 2024 we think there could be as many 20 teams in league one and 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 every country needs this for its its pyramid system to work its way through and and yeah is the pinnacle right now mls absolutely um you know but could a market like santa barbara support mls no i mean as simple as that um not to say many years from now that it couldn't but from the perspective you think you'll get uh do you think you'll get a promotion and relegation system in place? Like, do you think that you can be one of the people to push that agenda in the States? It's, it's challenging because here you, you buy a franchise. And, and so when you buy a franchise, you know, you're an expansion franchise as we will be. It's a franchise to, to kind of do business in a particular league and, and franchise holders. You know, it's, it's no different. Look, if you, you talk about baseball, if, if, you know, the Dodgers got, had a really bad year in the NL West and got relegated to Triple A. Uh, the financial implications, you know, horrendous. Same way that you know the NFL uh, even you know sent down to a, to a, to a lower league teams to play. They're, they're built in a financial structure that that really doesn't allow promotion and relegation. Not to say that that won't change in future years, but right now the the business model of franchise sports franchise holders doesn't allow that to happen. So do you miss uh, Liverpool and what was it like growing up there and then being the CEO of the football club and then having success there? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was born, born and bred Liverpoolian. Um, my dad took me to Anfield, Liverpool's home stadium, when I was four years of age in, in 1959. And I've been an avid Liverpool fan as tens, if not hundreds of millions of people uh, are uh, since then. And so, um, it, you know, it's in your blood and particularly in, in working class cities in, in, in places like the north of England, where Liverpool is situated, you don't have a lot going for you. And, and so you aspire to play and, and pretty quickly you realize you're not going to be good enough. But then you're a fan and, and, and it gives you something bigger in, than your current life to, to, to hang on to, to put your arms around, to be a part of. And so being a, a, a Liverpool fan or, you know, further up the road, Manchester United or Manchester City or down in London, Chelsea, Arsenal, Spurs. These are multi-generational clubs. And by that, I mean your granddad 
you know, my great granddad, I think, was a Liverpool right. fan. Definitely my granddad was. Certainly my dad was. And so, yeah, A, you've got no choice. And B, it, it, it's a linkage to your, you know, your, your ancestry that, that right. you're a red rather than a blue. And so, so do you kind of feel like you actually haven't left in some capacity just because it's in your blood and, you know, maybe you don't, you're not CEO there anymore, but you're just Liverpool pool is part of who you are. Yeah. Now I, I, I was a fan before, a um, little bit more difficult being a, a, an out and out fan. When you're the CEO, you've, you've got to rein yourself in a little bit and make some decisions uh, right. less from the heart, more from the head. And, and, and uh, but then once uh, you, you know, I uh, worked out my contract uh, and we had a tremendous three seasons whilst I was there and we, we accomplished so much on the pitch, but we accomplished a ton off the pitch as well. Um, but I'm back to being a fan. And, and like all fans, um, even here in Santa Barbara, those early morning games, we'll go down to the pub and we'll watch. You know, there's a big group growing here in Santa Barbara since my arrival here of Liverpool fans that will come up from Ventura or down from San Luis Obispo and obviously from in Santa Barbara itself. Um, there is a very sophisticated network of official Liverpool supporters clubs around the world, about 315 of them now. Um, and so wherever I go in the world, uh, down in your way in LA, it's Jocks of Dailies mm-hmm. there in Culver City. And, and I'll always try to find um, the, the local official Liverpool supporters club to go watch the game with the fans. And, you know, the good news is most of them recognize me and, and, and we have a great time together. And uh, it's a thoroughly enjoyable couple of hours. Obviously, if they win, not so much if they don't win. Were you, I mean, I think I know for a fact, just from looking at your life, like you were in Liverpool throughout the 60s. Um, What was it like, like Beatlemania, honestly? Like, what was it like having those four guys um, kind of take over the world from your hometown, um, like while you were a kid? Like, I would, I'd almost liken it to, um, I grew up in Chicago in the 90s, and it was just like having Jordan is imprinted on me forever. Um, sure. And, you know, how about those fellows who left their mark on the world? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I, I, I was a little young. I mean, um, so I would grow up by the mid 60s. And, by you know, I was still living in Liverpool when they pretty much played their last live concert. I mean, it was um, it was a short period of time they were together. Their impact on the world has grown subsequent to that so uh i'm you know a massive massive beatles fan i embrace not only their music which i pretty much know everything about it but also their impact as you know four lads from liverpool and you know i'm I'm, it's never lost on me when i say liverpool even to this day there's only two things that ever come back to you is football and the beatles and you know so the beatles did such an unbelievable job of changing the world they were living in uh, you know, and, and today it, it's only in the last 10 or 15 years that the city has kind of embraced the Beatle history and Beatles statues on the waterfront and Beatles tours and Beatles museum. Um, you know, but it's been something that, you know, uh, the music is timeless, as you well know. Uh, What's and, your favorite uh, record? Oh, I mean, I mean, it's very hard to do that with the Beatles, first of all. Um, but for me, it's like immediately, um, I love Strawberry Fields Forever, and I love that whole album. Um, also, you know, I love the experimentation on White Album, and I'm the Walrus, yeah. and like I, I yeah. always, it really, and really anything from their discography, because I think also people get really wrapped up in the like prestige of some of the later period um experimental psychedelic stuff but even those early just like pop jams like she loves you is such a perfectly written simple pop song um so i find myself going back to like i want to hold your hand and stuff too but i'm just yeah music is is my thing just as much as sports or anything and uh the beatles played a big role in my developing my taste you, you look, because you can, and I'm looking right now at the entire Beatles discography I've got in mono uh, on my record play, just over to my left shoulder here. You can go from those early days of help, I want to hold your hand, please, please me, you know, honest, just plain bubblegum pop, if you will, but still, when you put it on today and you hear the first chords, immediately your spirits are lifted. You can watch their 
the periods of, 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 of self-discovery, you know, during trips to, to India to see the Maharishi, John Lennon starting to take a, a, a more pronounced role and as he split away with Yoko and doing Imagine. So the whole phaseology, Rubber Soul, you're right, the White Album. And then, of course, culminating in an Abbey Road, um, which I can I probably listened to 500 times, um, you know, and, and you can still put and I listen on vinyl because that's the way you should experience mm-hmm. Beatles music. And um, for me, like any any real uh, good music that is cultural, I, I'm I am taken back to a point in time when I first heard those records. Abbey Road, I'll always remember I was in high school senior studying for the equivalent, if you will, of SATs and, and stood in line for that and just had it playing in the background over and over and over again. So, so yeah, but the Beatles are inextricably intertwined now in Liverpool, even more so than when they were, you know, playing and performing and, and doing studio recordings. Yeah, that's really cool to hear from a native. I'm I'm really big on trying to understand people's perspective at that time. Um, like going back for things that I wasn't necessarily present for. And then, of course, I love a good documentary. I love a good book. I'll even like run through a Wikipedia, but I always appreciate like a firsthand account from someone. And while we're talking about music, you know, part of the premise of the podcast is talk about other passions. And I think you're such a perfect guest because your resume is just, like I said, across so many different industries. So with what I said about perspective and hearing a firsthand account in my, like I'm a serious gamer guy. I would say I'm like so serious, but I grew up with it. Like I'm just a product of the nineties where it was just a part of the culture. And it was like something I grew up native to. Um, you have spent time at, I mean, really pillars of my life and so many others, you know, probably the whole front office sports audience, electronic arts, Sega, Microsoft, Xbox. I'm just trying to figure out across across my, you know, decades of gaming, like there's so many, there's so many things. I was always intertwined in like almost like the theater of it. Like being in middle school when Dreamcast hit, I'll never forget, 9999. And then PS2 came out and it was like January 01. They got out of hardware. Sega got out of hardware, which was like really rough to me dreamcast was such a i've seen you're a huge advocate of of dreamcast and and it was i mean that's when we had we had the 56k in the back that we could plug in and it was just like all these new concepts were introduced um and then i've been an xbox primarily player since um since 360 and really thought that you know some special things happened during your tenure and really set them up for What's pretty impressive now with the whole, I talked about this on like the, a previous episode, but just between Game Pass, I have the streaming on my phone. Now they're on TVs. Um, what are you, we could spend like hours talking about gaming. So I want to be conscious of time and just from like a higher level, what was it about gaming in the 90s and the 2000s? Um, that is almost almost like the defining feature for you. And then when you look at the industry now and see how, you know, not this has been the case for a while, but like, uh, you know, the revenue of a hit game is like significantly bigger than a hit movie. Um, like everything has changed. I wonder what someone who was so close to it his whole career, um, you know, just thinks about the progress. Well, you, you look back and, and, and you're exactly right. You know, I was at Reebok and, and um, you know, 43, 44 years of age then. And, 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 you know, you have this career change. An executive recruiter calls me in, in 1998 and says, what do you know about video games? And, and nothing, uh, you know. Uh, and, and the reason he called me was that during that period, if you will, in, in, in the life cycle of gaming, it was still very much a toy. It was boys in their bedrooms. It was young teens and, and it was a phase you grew through because the content was was pretty junior you know and and you didn't have what we're all used to now the very mature content that is you know reflective of the types of things you go watch at movies it wasn't that way in the late 90s my job was to launch the dreamcast in north america eventually um saying yes yeah i'll give it a go um immerse myself in gaming culture straight away because i had nine months to launch the dreamcast um from when i arrived 
uh, within five months, I was president of Sega of America, and we were building a launch plan in advance of the PlayStation 2 launching because we knew we were in the eye of a storm right there. Um, also, your commercials dream- were amazing during that era. Yeah. Like, uh, I think the first ones were airing like MCV VMAs. That was the one that Chris Rock hosted. And oh my God, I was just like waiting for it to come on the TV. All the characters, like great work that uh, on behalf of my generation, the Dreamcast was so important. Yeah. I mean, landing Sega, one of the things, I mean, without we could spend hours, you're right, was, was, was to rehabilitate the image after the Sega Saturn, you know, to get back to the glory days of the Sega Genesis and also to, have a fighting chance against the PlayStation 2 coming out. So one of the things when I got there, you know, I wanted to understand more deeply the, the Sega brand. We brought back the Sega screen uh, a little bit. We brought back the irreverency of what Sega was all about. We, we decided on a big splash, which was the VMAs in New York City, and I was there on 9999. We were very fortunate with the numerology of the date. You know, we thought we're going to yeah. own this, and the VMAs were the same night. And, and I think, you know, when you look back at that launch lineup, um, you know, it was it will never, ever be usurped as the best launch lineup for a, a console in history. The amount of brand new IP, you know, from the Ready to Rumble, Trick Style. Power Stone uh, is the Power most Stone, underrated. Nitro, uh, you know, obviously Soul Calibur and games like that when we're, we're not original IP, but then you get your crazy taxis and everything else. And then Sega having the foresight uh, to be able to to see where online gaming was going, it became the first online enabled console. You know, albeit to your point with a 56k board modem, but it brought it brought gaming into a different space in the in the minds of not just teenage boys, which was primarily gaming in those days, but people seeing the opportunity to build big social networks and and, and gaming, Sega Net and the like, were the first real social network to to come together where you could play and talk and, you know, you had a microphone. It all sounds like, of course you did, but this was pretty revolutionary uh, in in those days, 20, 23, 24 years ago now. And the Dreamcast was a wonderful, still is a wonderful console. The games that that we were able to launch, um, you know, still resonate. Radio. Yeah, people are... People want that uh, remaster, by the way. Like, I, I love no, I, not not my not my not within my power to do uh, a Sega Dreamcast remasters anymore. But but yeah, and so I was fortunate, Ernest, to be to be plunged into gaming at the time when it was really finding its feet and was it needed people like me from the outside a little bit and personalities to. To, to go on the stage and do daft things like getting tattoos and, um, you know, from the perspective of, of making gaming, getting it the respect that it deserved. It was still very much, you know, looked down upon uh, from the entertainment world. And, and, and now, you know, biggest entertainment medium in the world, when you look at it as regards annual revenues and, and how many people will play a game every single day every hour of every day yeah peter i saw this like this like meme that basically that kind of describes what you're talking about i don't know if you've ever seen the like the guy walking in he's like a drawn sick figure and it's like hey son how you doing um and people have like manipulated to say hundreds of different things but probably my favorite ever one that i saw because i thought it really like encapsulated the period that we're in basically said 20 years ago the dad is walking in the room and he's saying, like, like, hey, son, uh, get off those video games, go outside, play a sport or something. And then they have 20 years later, <laughs> the dad is going to his kid outside. And he's like, stop playing. Get inside and practice your video games. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's become part and parcel of, of, of popular culture in, in broad terms, not just entertainment, not just games, not just um, young men and, and, and increasingly um, young women as well. It's, my it's, daughter, it's my daughter plays like my daughter plays everything. Uh, she's on the Xbox. She's on a Nintendo Switch and like pretty much like, you know, my my sister in law, all these everybody I know plays. I don't even view it as a boy thing anymore. Like and it kind of just happened. Um, and I know, you know, obviously a lot of the the audience is still male, but um, it's not what it was it's not seen as this childish thing and it's not seen as this overwhelmingly um 
male thing anymore. Like the amount of IP in Hollywood that is coming from gaming and it isn't even this big pronounced thing anymore. I remember it used to be like, oh, they're giving... Now we have Mario coming out next year, like a, a, a blockbuster tentpole, which we'll see how that goes. But like, it's just part of the conversation. What was the... What were like the EA and uh, and Xbox tenures like? Well, I, you know, I... I at the sad demise of the Dreamcast, you know, it was time for me to... Um, to move on. I mean, Sega was going to go, and I helped lead this in North America to be a, what's known as a third party, which you know their games would be made for for all platforms, and that was that was sad, but was necessary. We simply didn't sell enough Dreamcast to justify uh, staying in the hardware business. And then I built a rapport with the folks at Xbox because they were helping us enormously. With with uh, the, the Dreamcast was actually built on Windows CE uh, operating system. And the guys at Xbox were very supportive, helping us get through things, you know, taking some of our content onto their platform, which gave us some much needed revenue and, and distribution. Um, and, you know, got an offer to, to go up there, sit down, have lunch with Steve Ballmer, uh, talk about the industry. And Steve said, we need somebody like you. We need somebody that could be out front. Uh, we're, we're very much an engineering company, obviously, and we mm-hmm. need people who are marketers that, that could be, you know, representation of the Xbox. And in this particular instance, my job was to come in uh, two years in advance of building what became known as the Xbox 360. It was Xenon was its working title when I got there. And we built not only the hardware, but more importantly, the software, the services, the peripherals, everything that went with the Xbox 360 launch. And I thoroughly enjoyed my time there. It was such a such an innovative uh, console again, you know, with... Um, expandable uh, memory, you know, the different hard drives you can put on there. Great content. Halo being something, obviously, I think that really changed the way people started to look at games. Um, and, and online, most importantly, if you will, Xbox, Xbox Live, Live. Finally getting going here and, 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 and getting to scale and bucking the trend of the other guys. It was for free. And at Xbox, we said, look, we're going to build a, a world-class uh, service for you. It's going to be five bucks a month, and it's going to be well worth it. And and it was. And so we we spent a lot of time getting that right, spent a lot of time learning all of the challenges and obstacles when you build a global community via the internet and, and lots of little slip-ups along the way of, of managing that community and, and making it a safe and welcoming place for everybody. Um, and and I, with great pride, look back on those days of, of what we were able to accomplish there. And, you know, despite things like the Red Rings of Death and all of the things that could have derailed uh, where Xbox is today. I mean, if we didn't resolve Red Rings of Death in the way that we did, uh, I know darn well there'd be no Xbox today. Uh, yeah, can I just say, know, like, uh, you converted me with the 360. I was a PlayStation guy. Um, I don't want to, like, mention this every <laughs> podcast, but somehow it comes up with gaming. But... I was a PlayStation guy. I converted at 360. I've been with Xbox since. Um, so I guess that's you're the reason why I'm an Xbox game repeater. But also, uh, the Red Rings of Death were handled well. Like, I remember I got one, and I was exempt. I thought, oh, I dodged it, and then I got it. And it was so simple. I just sent it to you all. You sent me back an Xbox. It was like a week or so. And uh, my opinion of Microsoft like took no dip from that. Uh, from that just because it was such a seamless experience but yeah xbox um and microsoft getting into gaming is such a interesting development in the industry i saw and spoke with briefly steve Ballmer um at like a clippers event uh probably two or three weeks ago because he's refurbishing every single basketball court in los angeles and uh it was pretty cool um I love that whole era, like that mid 2000s, Microsoft, um, you know, Apple has like suddenly become like the coolest thing on the block after a very like PC centric 90s. Um, And things like Xbox were just like so hugely influential in, I think, like turning the image around and, and bringing that whole company into the next level. And now you see every time the earnings reports hit and you got Satya Nadella, talking about gaming it is just it's no longer a niche part of the business um you know it's breaking breaking records for revenue and 
Uh, it's really cool to hear about that foundational period, like from someone who was there. Yeah, I mean, look, when I was there, we we weren't we weren't even on main campus. We wanted to be separate. We were building. We had we had uh, prematurely probably dropped the original Xbox. It was losing money every box, so we were mm-hmm. not actually shipping anything during this period because everything was geared up for the fight. You know, a couple of years down the road, and to get out ahead of the the PS3 and, and, and make sure that we made our mark with the right content and the right price and the right console uh, with the right upgradability. We also eschewed putting a telephone wire connection in there. So you're going right to broadband. If you don't have broadband, well, then maybe this this isn't for you. And that was sounds ridiculous now. Of course you put broadband. But in those days, that was, was a gutsy move. When we first started development of the Xbox 360 from a hardware perspective, 80% of the world was still accessing the internet through a dial-up modem. So it was a courageous move there. But, but you know, I look back with the team there, we, we went very big um, and, and the courageous bets we made uh, mm-hmm. to launch the Xbox 360. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm infamous for saying first to 10 million wins. I think we, we were first to 10 million. Um, I owe, so you he, all took that generation. Like, I, I think long-term, maybe PS3 might have caught up, but I remember being very, almost like, proud i i think console wars are they have their issues right but like i've i've said before on this podcast it's like people just like rivalry and so it it adds some like entertainment to the conversation you know even even if you can get both it's kind of like an ideological battle and people are just attracted to that that's why our sports and our everything is set up the way that it is yeah i mean we 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 built and, and, and we encourage the console wars, not not to create division, but to challenge each other. When I say each other, I mean Microsoft versus Sony. If Microsoft hadn't uh, of, of stuck, stuck the course after the Xbox, after the Red Rings of Death, gaming would be a poorer place for it. You, you really wouldn't have the competition you have today. Um, two big behemoths like Microsoft and Sony investing billions of dollars each um, is, is good for gaming. It's as simple as that. They have to be. They have to be great. Uh, otherwise, the the game is going to go to the other guy. And so, it's great for the industry. It's great for gamers. And and you know, I'm delighted to see Nintendo with the Switch as well, giving you know a slightly different experience, obviously, but also as a player in there. So, the industry's never been healthier. You know, I was fortunate then to to get an offer to um, to move to EA, which You're I did as CEO president of EA of- Sports, which played into my experience, you know, obviously at, at Microsoft and Sega previously, but also in my days at Reebok and prior to that at Patrick, which was a soccer shoe company that, that was my first real job here in America. So, um, and, and I had 10 years at EA, uh, 10 wonderful years at EA, uh, that, you know, first four years president of, of EA Sports and then chief operating officer uh, after that um, and, and led the company along with a great group of people we called the engine room. Um, through some challenging times, but then we moved away from focus on physical manufacturing of discs and selling to retailers and, and building out network infrastructure, direct delivery to your hard drives, customer service, all of the things that a direct-to-consumer business needs to be. And, and uh, you know, EA can be polarizing within the gamer community. I love it. It's a great company with great people that, despite what everybody says, makes great content. Yeah, and from like a business standpoint, I think the community has a lot of issues with microtransactions, right? And with um, you know, like Ultimate Team and, and and all of that. But one, I I worked at 2K um at some point in the past and like had that that first person view. It's it's pretty remarkable if you're the COO and you're you're tasked with what you're tasked with to see some of these these things that have come in like Fortnite is free to play like you know Fall Guys is free to play and all the money is in the transactions and the accessories and all of that I feel like I feel like as much as that has become a point of contention in the community from like a business perspective and FOS where we're like reporting on their uh, earnings reports and stuff you you have to step back and at least in my opinion admire what they've been able to do over the past like three decades in terms of building a business. Um, And obviously you were really close to that as a president, as a COO. Yeah. I mean, look, free to play games, 
we always knew ultimately they would arrive. But a free-to-play game can cost 50 to $100 million to develop and maintain and to be a live service with hundreds of people keeping that service up and running 24-7. So somewhere along the line, you've got to cover your costs at least, if not make money. And that's where buying skins or avatars, you know, um, uh, having those microtransactions in the game are, are, are necessary. Otherwise, you can't afford to make the game if you're not going to see the revenue come back can't afford to employ people to make the game and and you know in, in EA's case i think it's i don't know 8000 9000 people now um that that all work very hard to make games um some of them are still you know triple a $60 off the shelf games some of them are free to play uh like an apex legends and and, and but great content I love free to play because I'll play, and if I choose to spend money, then I choose to spend money. Particularly on 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 mobile, where I play a lot, and just about everything is free to play there. But I, I get the business right. model, and you know, you can either choose to grind and and enjoy it that way, or or you can spend a few dollars. And yeah, no, on Assassin's not- Creed, on Assassin's Creed, I need the XP boost. Like I I can't sit up and grind that all day. Um, what do you think of the breakup between FIFA and EA? I mean. Either way, it's not exclusive anymore. Like that landscape is about to change. And then also, I've always wondered, like, is EA going to get back into basketball? You know, are they over there cooking something up? Um, Right now, it's just like it's Madden and it's all the other IP. But like, what do you think is going to happen now that business has changed with FIFA and that like NBA has been on the back burner for, you know, three, four years now? Well, certainly the, the the FIFA arrangement now uh, it, with the last game. Obviously, you saw the the cover announcement yesterday, which is great to see a woman on the cover, Samantha Kerr of Chelsea, uh, along with Kylian Mbappe, obviously. But from the perspective of that relationship, thirty years in now, I think EA and certainly when I was there, we always took a look at it. We we loved working with them. We had helped build the FIFA brand, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, I, and I was fond of reminding our, our friends in Zurich that that. You know, during some of their more challenging times, we were the best thing that they had. We also, with the FIFA game, introduced the game to hundreds of millions of people over 30 years, you know, in, in, in shipping every single year a deep game, particularly in the last decade, particularly with online enabled. And, and you know, like Ultimate Team or dislike Ultimate Team, you've got 15,000 players there. And, and in my, you know, final couple of years, as, as Ultimate Team was really ramping up, you'd, you'd have great conversations with players about, you know, I found this left back out of Lithuania who plays for this club. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they the depth of understanding of the game, the depth of understanding of the history of the game, who the big clubs are, which leagues, how all the leagues work, how FIFA works, how UEFA works, how CONCACAF works, uh, who are the young up-and-coming players in smaller leagues around the world. I mean, these are fascinating conversations. And and, and, and what FIFA did was educate an entire generation um, at a level that, that actually the real FIFA uh, couldn't do, if you will. And it, liter- uh, it literally did for me, by the way. Like World Cup 06 and playing that FIFA edition in the dorm room that year, I was starting college. Like that's what taught me soccer. <laughs> and I've, yeah. you know, I've followed it since. I think, but in answer to your question, EA probably simply made a business decision of what the license was costing them and what, and what it was going to cost them in the next phase. Looked at the value, and you'd, every licensee and licensor always have these conversations. What is it worth? And, and EA probably said, it's time now. FIFA gives us, yes, it gives us a World Cup, but, but, but little else. It gives us national teams. Um, and it got to the point, I think, ultimately, that EA just made a strategic business decision said, well, look, we can, we can save this money. We can build our own brand, EA Sports FC or whatever it's going to be. Um, and, and we can invest deeper uh, it, with our development teams and our live services teams with money that all, or ordinarily would have gone to Zurich to, to, to FIFA. Um, it, it, you know, it's risky. Uh, the, the, when you've built something as enduring as as fifa which becomes a video game more than the federation of international football associations right. you you stop a kid down on the street here in santa barbara you say fifa they'll say video game right. um and so but i think also ea probably feels comfortable now that that you know nobody is easily going to come in and and take the fifa license and and be an immediate competitor to what they built you've always got to remember 
that within that game, there's over 300 licenses. There's all the leagues. Mm-hmm. There's even the federations. You've got Champions League. You've got the leagues themselves, in particular, exclusive with the Premier League and, and, and Bundesliga. You've got all of the clubs that they have exclusive deals with. So it's very difficult for somebody to come in and immediately uh, compete with a compelling, authentic experience because of what EA has managed to build uh, around its, its licensing structure for the game. Yeah, really interesting perspective there. Because um, I've thought about it, and we've we've covered it quite a bit. But yeah, those are some realities of it that put it into better perspective for me. They're bringing back NCAA next summer. Like you know, some reports have come out. They're saying about July twenty twenty three, which is huge, especially in this NIL era. Um, so in general, I think that that's just going to be like an important moment for the company. Um, But like I said, NCAA is back. Do you think NBA is back? Any of your buddies over there told you, oh yeah, we're, we're coming for 2k. I, I, you know, my own opinion, I've been gone from EA for a few years now, five years. uh, So, you know, none of my buddies are telling me anything. Um, I was, I was there uh, when we, we actually didn't ship an NBA live one year for, for a lot of reasons and very difficult to, to catch up. That gave NBA 2K obviously huge momentum as the only game in the market that year. And it's difficult to recapture that the same way FIFA created this, you know, almost unassailable position versus Pro Evo, um, you know, by just doing everything that I was just talking about. NBA 2K has done a phenomenal job in, in building a fortress uh, around that game. Um, and, and it's not going to be easy for EA, no matter how good the game is. You've got the network effect of, of what 2K has been able to, to build over these last seven or eight years, because it's been longer than three, four years, it's been seven or eight years, if I recall, when we didn't ship NBA Live. Um, right. but, but I think the last you know, one was the uh, Live 19 at the end of tw- um, 18, I guess. Yeah, well, there was a year when we just it was when I, I was do remember just, that one. No, I remember that was sort of like the first fracture in the in the situation where it was like, oh, there's just randomly no live this year. Yeah, well, a lot of reasons for that, but yeah, I think look, I think I think NCAA football once EA figures out how to pay the players now because you can figure mm-hmm. out some kind of a, a way to recompense the players for their image rights. Um, and, and I think that to your point, that's always been a fan favorite, always been a great game. It was, it was sad that it had to, um, had to be taken off the shelf because of all of the legal issues with, with players in the NCAA. But it sounds to me like they're finding a way around that now that everybody can be happy with. And look, I think everybody wants college football to come back. So I think it'd be a great day when that ships. So Peter Moore, what do you do now We've talked about so many things. I really, really appreciate your time um, and just like in-depth insights and all of these things that me personally and I think, you know, FOS readers uh, find interesting. But what do you do now as someone who's been at EA, been at Sega, Microsoft, you CEO of Liverpool, um, now you have this team, you know, USL, Santa Barbara, um, how much of your energy is going toward that? And just how do you see the next decade or next year, or however long you're thinking ahead uh, for yourself after doing just so many things and expressing your passions in, in so many different ways across like many of the most relevant industries to our culture? Well, yeah, I, the team's great, but that's my spare time evenings and weekends thing. You know, I, I'm senior vice president, general manager of live entertainment and sports at Unity. And so I, I joined Unity um, based on John Riccatello, my former boss at EA, is the CEO at Unity and lured me back, showed me some very interesting technology whilst I was still living in Liverpool that is focused around volumetric capture in sports. Um and, and came uh, joined Unity in January of last year. Uh, and it's a full-time job for me. And it's an exciting place where we're looking at volumetric capture to bring real-time 3D experiences to broadcast, to analysis in sports. And concurrently working with companies like Live Nation Insomniac to bring the virtualization of the digital experience of real-life concerts to people in their homes. So having a, a, a virtual experience of a concert like 
EDC, um, which we're really focused on right now. So I, I got plenty to do. I, I, and I've got a team now that's growing and, and uh, that has taken from where we were kind of an incubation, working in sports right now with UFC uh, and uh, building out plans to volumetrically capture a full fight card in the not too distant future. And what, what real-time 3D is, Ernest, is the ability for you to get your touchscreen, your iPad, your, your smartphone, and manipulate the action and to see things at angles that you want to see them and to drop down into different camera angles into the octagon, onto the basketball court, onto the soccer pitch in what we call impossible camera angles. So you're right there where physical cameras can't go. And, and that is the technology that my team and I are working on right now uh, with a view, as I say, in the world of sports, looking at UFC, which is which is perfect for what we need to do controlled environment very innovative league if you will um that is um uh, totally um in back to my years of video games i remember ufc and e3 and you know it was very mm -hmm. much the light that the company was crave entertainment that was putting out ufc and it was really small um kind of cage fighting and and, and it, it it what it has done to, to to build its brand and its image and its and its footprint around the world has been immense. And so we're, we're delighted to work with them. Uh, and, and as I say, to be the first sport that we will volumetrically capture. And then the same with Live Nation with Insomniac. Great people there that put on events every weekend, massive EDM events every weekend. And that, that millions of people wish they could go to, but they can't or they can't afford to. Well, our job is to bring that to them right there in their home. So that's what I'm working on full time. I'm on the boards of two great video game companies, Nifty Games. Uh, and motorsport games, nifty games up in the Bay Area, motorsport games in Miami. Uh, motorsport has got the NASCAR license. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and, and the football club on top of that. And then long term project, I'm, I'm, I'm writing uh, my autobiography before I forget all of this stuff. Wow. Um, got a lot of stuff going on, Peter. I, I wonder what that adoption is going to be like for the work that you're doing at Unity. Like, do you think that we are just unequivocally going to see that be a major part of the social experience going forward? It's like, I think naturally with everything, there's skepticism and you can look up newscasters in the 90s who are like, ha ha, the Internet, what's that silly thing? Um, you know, I know that that's always been the fact with technology, but, you know, I wonder just how serious are we going to be when it comes to like blending these worlds? But unity is saying it's happening. It's coming. It's on the way. Uh, this will be by say the 2030s, just a regular part of life. Yeah. Look, it, it, it puts control in, in, in your hands rather than the producer there. You want to see something at a particular angle. You want to see whether something was offside, whether it was a penalty, you know, whether mm -hmm. the ball did cross the plane in the NFL and you can spin that camera around at any angle and in any position you want. And we're, we're, we're going to ultimately take that for granted. But this, to me, as somebody of my age, is reminiscent of when sports went from being broadcast in black and white to color. Uh, and, and equally, when it went from standard definition to high definition, obviously, and you're seeing sports in a completely different way. And again, you go back. God forbid you have to watch something in black and white now. But we all did. I mean, mm -hmm. you certainly did. I did. But, but I do remember in 07, I was, again, I was in college and those first HD, like 720p blew my mind. I had a 23 inch Samsung and I was like, oh my God, you know? So I, I can, I could see us having that type of experience when we can get in and, you know, understand a lot better. Did, did yeah. they actually go out of bounds in that NBA game? Uh, you know, they have the camera angles now, but what you're proposing yeah, is certainly interesting. Yeah. I mean, what we're proposing is, is you put your finger on the screen and spin the action around through what we call six degrees of freedom. And you, you can put that camera wherever you want on, on, on a virtual dolly and say, I want to, I want to be in the penalty area when that goal is scored. I want to be in the end zone when that catch is made. I want to be on the ice when the goalie makes that save. All of these things um, will, will be second nature, you know, I may not be around to, to, to witness it and enjoy it, but that's what I'm working on with my team right now. And, and, and Unity is, you know, one of the top creative tools in the world uh, with obviously, you know, the majority of mobile games running on Unity, but more and more creators around the world in social media and content creators using Unity. 
um, you know, I'm working at the high end of that to be able to bring um, content creation to life in real time, 3D, concurrently with wherever this metaverse is going to be. Uh, and we think we're already in it and it's it's finding its way now. Uh, we're going to be a big part of that. I can't think of anything bigger than sports and entertainment to, to drive the adoption. Great. Well, we'll look out for that. Thank you so much for sharing all of your experiences and your insights with all the awesome things that you've done throughout your career. Um, I personally am so grateful because now I have a whole different understanding of things that have fascinated me for decades now. So I really appreciate you bringing that to the table uh, for everybody listening on FOS. And I can't wait to see what you do the rest of this decade and beyond with Unity. Um, I would like to get in there and twist the camera around when uh, when I'm watching sports. So keep me posted. And uh, thank you so much for your time, Peter. That's a wrap on another episode of the My Other Passion podcast. I want to thank Peter Moore for coming out. Love that guy. Love that conversation. Personally for me, and I certainly hope for you, it was incredible to hear about all these things that I grew up playing. Sega, Xbox 360, all the amazing games during his tenure at EA Sports, and just being a fan of sports, hearing from a CEO of Liverpool, hearing from somebody who just bought a USL team in Santa Barbara. So many different perspectives, so many different angles, and he certainly brought it for the entirety of that conversation. If you enjoyed the conversation, go ahead and hop on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. Leave us a review. Give us those five stars. Let us know what you think. Uh, We'll be back next Wednesday, as always. Thanks for tuning in to My Other Passion.